In a little over a month, we will complete our largest construction project since the first one on this mountain a little over 20 years ago. Yeah, that's exciting. That's good stuff. And uh, we will have more parking spaces than we've ever had. Yeah, it's a lot. Of, uh, we will have more check-in stations for children than we've ever had. We will have more square footage than we've ever had. We will have more classrooms for our children than we've ever had. And we need it because we have more people than we've ever had. You may not know this, but in the last three years, in each of the last three years, we have grown by about 15 to 20% each year. And that's just amazing. It's a testimony to God's goodness, to our dynamite staff team, to our gifted lay leaders, our incredible volunteers, and to you. You help create a, a culture and a community that people want to be a part of. You have invited friends. You serve. And you've created this environment that, that, that people are, are wanting to step into, to find faith, to discover community together. And because of the size of church that we are, because of the environment that you've helped create, I just want to be honest here. We can have a lot of nice things. Like we can throw a pretty awesome jingle jam. We can, ha we have a great student ministry that's fully staffed, a, a great children's ministry team that's fully staffed, great adult ministries for groups and serving. And, and we have, we can just have all kinds of great ministries in the things and the areas and the age groups that we all care about. And those are things we all want in a church. And they serve us very well. And we could, you know, because of the environments that we've created, we could just say, you know, that's enough. I mean, it's good. It's pretty full downstairs. Got, got, got a nice crowd on Sunday nights with students. And it, it's worth asking a question that a lot of people ask when it comes to church. How big is big enough? How big is big enough? I mean, come on. Isn't it all just about the pastor's ego anyway? Right? Don't just all pastors just want to pastor a big church? Because let's be honest here this morning. We're in church. We might as well be. None of us really want to go to a mega, mega church. None of us want to have trouble finding a parking space. I know that because you clapped when I talk about parking. <laughs> None of us really want to have to wait in line to pick up our kids. None of us want to walk into the auditorium and find someone we don't know sitting in our seat. <laughs> How big? It's big enough. And we could just put the clamps on right now and just say, it's a pretty good sized church. We finally have a little more space to spread out. And if we, if we decided that that's what we wanted to do, all we need to do is just tweak our mission statement just a shade. Like right now, if you're new, our, our mission statement is we invite and equip people to follow Jesus. And if we decide that we're just big enough, we're not sure, you know, like it's, it's enough, it's good the way it is, it's comfortable the way it is, all we need to do, it's just a slight tweak, it's not that big of a deal. We just need to change it to we invited and equipped people to follow Jesus. Past tense. But we don't do that anymore. We did it. Got to a good, comfortable size where we have a lot of nice things for our kids, for our families, for our lives. But we don't, we don't do that anymore. A little equipping, a little equipping, but we certainly don't, don't do any inviting. I mean, if more new people show up, then we won't, we'll be too big then. And, you know, when people say that, but like, you know, I'm just not sure. I just want us to get so, I don't know if I want us to get so big. It's just what I always just think about, what I always want to ask is, well, okay, let's say we'd make that decision. And the next Sunday is the Sunday that your friend 
that you've been inviting for years shows up. But we've instructed our greeters that if you see anyone you don't recognize, to say, oh, I'm so sorry. We've decided we're big enough and we just don't have room for one more. Of course, you know that's ridiculous, right? Because when the one is yours, there's always room for one more. When it's your aunt, your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, your spouse, your adult child, there's always room for one more. And I know this is true about you because when that actually happens and your friend does come, this is what happens. Sometimes people grab me by the shoulders and you say, you come up to me on Sunday morning in the atrium and you, you say, Carter, my friend finally came today. I've been inviting them for years. And if you didn't know that, that is church code speak for Carter, don't stink it up today. We don't need a base hit. We need a home run today, Carter. Right? Because in your spirit, when your one finally walks through that door, that, that fire reignites in you that this is about reaching them, your friend, your family, your coworker, your neighbor. You need to know that we are not building this incredible new facility for us. And we did not do it so that our kids could have a really nice place to come to church. We did not give sacrificially for our future. We did it for one more. Good morning. So glad that you're here. I uh, introduced myself to you earlier. If, you, uh, uh, if you're one of our regulars, it's so great to see you each and every Sunday morning. If you are new, I want to invite you into a conversation and really invite you into a vision for what we're all about. You may be new and even new to faith and exploring faith, or maybe you're just new to church. Maybe you've been a Christian, but you've never really gotten involved in church, or some of you are just kind of new because you're looking for a place to land. You, you find trying to find the right church for you, and I want to invite you into our, our, our vision. What you're going to hear today is a little bit of a family conversation. Uh, and if you walked in the door, we consider you family. If you logged on your computer or your phone, we consider you family. And what I hope you'll hear is what we are all about and why we are kind of doing what we're doing, why we do what we do. If you are new to faith and you even, wouldn't even consider yourself a Christian, this is especially important because I think you want to be a part of a faith community that is not about themselves. I think you are longing for a faith community that sees itself primarily to serve their neighbors. About two years ago, we launched something called the Four Campaign, and you've seen some of this stuff probably around, and today I kinda wanna invite you into that. Now, a big part of that was to raise money to build this building, and so many of you have sacrificially given to help make that happen. So grateful for that, but it was not just about a building, because of your generosity, uh, we have added so much support into the way that we serve our community, particularly the focus of this was the next generation. Uh, we've added uh, Zach Gibbs as our middle school director uh, to serve middle schoolers and students better. We've uh, moved Savannah Barnett into our outreach director for our students to help our students look outside their window a little bit more, look outside their walls to serve our community. Uh, we've added Mary Costin Bell to be special needs director, uh, coordinator for our, uh, for our children's ministry so that we can serve all families in Birmingham. And those are just, just to name a few. We've, we've, so much has been to been able to support our staff team to help lead our church to reach people in better ways. And we've reached out to our community in ways like never before. The whole campaign was not about us. It was about our community. We didn't, did, we didn't need more room for our kids. We needed more room for one more kid that you're inviting. For, one, for families that we haven't met yet. And for Birmingham to know that there is a church for them, that there's a church that has made room for them. Because we're not done inviting and equipping people to follow Jesus. We are just getting started. And I need your help. Um, 
So as we prepare for this new season, I wanted to take three weeks to kind of remind us of, of, our, of, of God's heart and our vision for this. And the reason for that, you're like, is because we're going to snap our fingers and we're going to be sitting around the Christmas tree with our families and this building's going to be open. And it's just going to go really, really fast in about the next two months because the holidays blur by. And I wanted to take a few weeks right before we get there, right before we open this building, to just remember that God has given us a holy burden for our community. And that's what we're calling this series, a holy burden, because this is why we did this. God has burdened our heart for one, burdened our heart for families, burdened our heart for Birmingham. When we started this project, we had about a thousand people in worship. And we believe that the Lord was calling us to double that number. But it was never about, um, it was never about reaching a thousand more people. It was about reaching one person a thousand times over. And, and that may lead to all kinds of, and if and when the Lord does that, that will lead to all kinds of things. We might one day outgrow this location if we actually do that. But we'll, we'll worry about that. We're just going to try to reach one person at a time a thousand times over. And this one person at a time, one at a time heart is the heart of Jesus. He told a story one time about going out to look for one sheep. Now, it's a story. One of the ways that we call it is a parable which is a made up story. It's a story that didn't really happen, but they are stories that hold truth. And when you hear a parable, the whole point is for you to go, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's true. Or oh yeah, that's what I would have done. Or oh yeah, that makes sense now. It was to share truth in relatable ways. And this story Jesus tells about a shepherd and a sheep. Now, it was a farming community, an agricultural world. This made sense to everyone because they were either a shepherd, they were related to a shepherd, they knew a shepherd, they grew up in a shepherding community. This is everybody knew when Jesus told this story. Like, oh yeah, makes complete and total sense. We're going to read Jesus telling this story in Matthew chapter 18. I like the way Matthew shares this story. Oftentimes when we read this story, we read it in the other place that it's found in the New Testament, which is in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, be great to read this week, is this whole chapter about lost things. It tells a story about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and finally the biggest story, a lost son, or sometimes what we call the prodigal son. But Matthew, he doesn't tell the story. He didn't write down the story of the lost coin, and he didn't write down the story of the lost son. He just told this really short story about the lost sheep, and I like the way that he shares it. Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples, and for whatever reason, you know, this one stuck out to him. Matthew 18 is where we're going to be. It's where the story is found. And that chapter starts out with Jesus's disciples asking him, hey, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Like they want to be great. Who's number one? Jesus, do you put out the disciples poll on Tuesday nights, like the college football playoff, like you rank us one through 12? Who's number one? Who's the best? And Jesus says something really strange when they ask this. Apparently, there are crowds around. There's some religious leaders. There's families. And Jesus grabs one of the little children. And he takes the child. And it says, Matthew says, he sits him in his lap or sits her in his lap. And he says, if you want to be great in the kingdom... You need to be like one of these little children. You need to have a childlike faith. I mean, if you want to know what greatness looks like, you need, you need to stop looking in the mirror. You need to look at these little ones. And then he says something pretty profound, which a lot of people say, like, you know, why, why are we so focused on the next generation? I, I would just say, like, Jesus... Because in verse 5, he says, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Do you want to know why we're building a millions and millions of dollars facility for children? Because Jesus says greatness is the kingdom looks like 
creating spaces where children are welcome. That's why. And then Jesus asked a question. And it's a question that everybody goes, "Uh uh-oh. In verse 12, he says, what do you think? And they're like, I don't think, Jesus. I don't want to do any thinking, right? No, could you just tell us the answers? Because they know when Jesus starts asking questions, you know, it's like, oh boy. And he's asking them like, hey, what do you think's true? I mean, they've already figured out like they were out of line asking about being great and like, okay, we get it. We're, we're totally off base here. We were thinking about us. You're thinking about others. Jesus says, what do you think? And then he, here's the question he wants them to answer. This rhetorical question. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? I mean, will he not? The, The shepherd could have cut his losses and said, Hey, one out of 100 ain't bad, right? I got to take care of the 99. I mean, 99 out of 100 is pretty doggone good. To all the students in the room, for the rest of your academic career, if I said sign up right now and you can have a 99 out of 100 on every test, you'd sign up for it, right? To the adults in the room, you would take a 99 out of 100 on your yearly performance review at work. We would all eat at a restaurant that had a 99 score from the health department, right? If you play Madden, you would love to have a team full of players with a 99 score. We all would take 99 out of 100. But if our student ministry took a retreat with 100 kids, And came back with 99. <laughs> because Josh was like, 99 out of 100 is pretty good. It's pretty good. It's an A plus. And we just lost one, so we just took off. <laughs> you know then that one matters. And every youth pastor in America would get fired after that, right? Because one matters. And everybody listening to the story knows that this is true when it comes to sheep, and it's certainly true when it comes to people. And Jesus says this. I mean, it's a rhetorical question. They know the answer. He's like, come on. What do you think? Of course, if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. You celebrate. When lost things get found, you tell everyone, you rejoice when you find something that's lost. A couple weeks ago, I lost my, uh, my armband that I put my phone in when I go jogging. And I have this place that I put it on our dresser. Sometimes it ends up on the kitchen counter if I come in and get water right after I run. I mean, it's either, and I just could not figure it out. Like I ran with it the morning before and the next morning, I'm like, where did I put that thing? I mean, I didn't take it off while I was, where did it go? And for about five days, I could not find that thing until I was in my closet one day and I had set it up on top of some shirts in the closet. And do you know what I did that afternoon when Emily got home? I said, hey, I found my armband. I mean, I was already looking on Amazon. Like, I wanted to order one of these stupid things. And, you know, it was just one of those things, that 15 bucks is gonna grind my gears because I just lost something. And I was so happy I found something. And there were thousands of things in my house that I did not lose and I did not celebrate them. But I celebrated when I found something. You've done that, your keys, your phone, your wallet. We celebrate. I mean, this, this is kingdom math, right? That one is greater than 99. One is greater than 99 in the kingdom. This is why we cheer and clap when three or four people get baptized in a room of 500 who have already been baptized. Because we know something mystical happened. Something worth celebrating happened. But I want to tell you that people get weird about this. Now, I want you to know something about 
about me. I've been in the 99 my whole life. I was raised in the church, uh, saved and baptized when I was about seven or eight years old. I have been a Christian for almost 40 years. I did not have a time where I wandered off from the faith. I have been in the 99 my whole life. So if you're in the 99, I just want you to know I resonate with you. I am one of you. But I have found that the 99 can get really hung up on life in the hills with the 99. And we want to do our Bible studies, and I love Bible studies, and we got opinions on the way things should, should go. And by the way, I mean, you know, the 99 pay for everything anyway, preacher. And I'm not telling you that the 99 aren't important. I tell you, I'm one of you. But most of the comments that I have received in 25 years of ministry have been people in the 99 about the needs of the 99. It is very rare that I get an email from someone in the 99 concerned that we're not doing enough to reach the one. I'd love that conversation. That's a, that's a great conversation. It's just easy to get caught up in life in the 99 and lose our burden for the one. But that is not the heart of the Father. He never forgets about the one. Listen to what Matthew writes next. But Jesus says these. In the same way, just like the shepherd runs after the one, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these ones should perish. Just not willing. He's not willing. The good shepherd has a burden for the one. He's not willing to be satisfied with 99 out of 100. Not willing to be okay with 99%. Not willing that one should perish. Not willing that one should miss out on eternal life. Not willing that one should not have a life-giving relationship with Jesus. He's just not willing. And that's why when it's about reaching the one, the work is never done. When it's about reaching the one, the work is never done. This is why we spent all this money on this building to reach one person a thousand times over. And it's not just to get them here, because our mission is to invite and equip them to follow Jesus. And I believe that God is calling some of you to be a part of the equipping some of the ones. Some of you in the 99. We need small group leaders to lead and disciple and equip some of the ones who are coming. Because this is not just about making physical space for new bodies and more bodies on our campus. This is about making spiritual space for their souls. And if we have more people on this campus but not more ways for them to grow, we will invite them and never equip them. And for some of you, you don't have kids, and this building isn't a big deal for you. You're never even going to go in the rooms. But I tell you what is a, can be a big deal for you. God is calling you to help disciple the parents of the children that will be in those rooms. God is calling you to help equip them. When it's about reaching the one, the work's never done. We'll always need one more small group to lead one more group of eight to 12 ones. Glenn Denton, she'll be on the stage right here at the end. She's our adult ministries pastor. Some of you need to come find her after service and say, I'll lead a group. What do you need? And we're going to eventually reach enough ones that there will come barely a time that we have room for one more person here, probably at about 2,000 in attendance. We'll have some questions that we'll have to ask about um, what are we going to do? Several months ago, one of our elders asked me in a meeting, we were talking about this. We were like, hey, let's look to the future. What does it look like at 1,800, 2,000 attendants, even when the building's built? And one of our elders asked a really good question. He said, are, are you going to be happy pastoring a church that size? And my response was, I'm happy now. I wasn't particularly happy about college football yesterday, but I'm happy now. Like right now, I'm happy. Like I love my job. 
I love our church. I love our, our fam, our community, our, our faith community. I love it. But when it's about reaching one, the work is never done. And so when that time comes, we'll have to be creative. If we can't fit more on this campus, well, is it a third service? Is it a second location? Whatever it is, because it is always about reaching one more. It's not just about our ambition to be a big church. And it's not just about our ambition to reach anyone. It's about reaching your one. And your one. And your one. And my one. I think Matthew wrote down this story because it resonated with him. He had been the one. He was a tax collector. Turned his back on his Jewish roots, family. A turncoat, a cheat, and a friend of the evil Roman Empire. And on a crowded street, Jesus didn't see a crowd. He saw one. And he invited one tax collector named Matthew to follow him. And Matthew wrote it down, everything that he learned over the next three years. Jesus saw one. And because of that, we're still naming little boys Matthew. I think Jesus still sees one. I want you to know something. I love the local church. I love church stuff. This should not come as a surprise to you. I love church stuff. I love nights of worship when our band, you know, they play like three or four songs on Sunday because we can't be in here for two hours because our children's volunteers would, that's not good. Um, But nights of worship, we play like eight or nine songs and we worship passionately. I love it. I love seeing small groups grow in their faith. During the week here, I get to see small groups that are in the living room. We have women's groups and men's groups and I can tell they're pouring over the word together. I love it. I love seeing people grow in their faith and find their purpose in serving. I just love church stuff. I love the local church, but I want you to know something. Nothing gets my fire going. Nothing excites me. Nothing does that thing in my heart more than seeing one person step into church for the first time, invited by a friend, finding it on the internet, finding faith in Jesus for the first time in their life and making a decision to follow him and make it public in baptism. That's every person that's been baptized at 2024 at Mountaintop. There were dozens of people greeting you when you walked in today. You didn't clap for any of them. Some of you went to small group this week and you didn't clap after small group. Great small group, guys. Good job. But you clapped when those people went in the water and came out a new person. Because you know something different happened. When it's about reaching the one, the work is never done. And as long as there's one more in Birmingham, and there are 1.1 million people in our metro area, and I just have a hunch they're not all in church today. And until they are, until they all know Jesus, until they all have a community of faith, the work is never done. So who is your one? Who's the one whose name you're thinking of right now? The one on your heart. The one that you're going to invite to come sit with you. Out in our atrium, there's this board. Some of you were here, a part of it, but some of you, you've come since this. You just walk by and you're like, they never explained that. I don't know what that's about. You don't know what it's about. When we launched this campaign, we wanted to say our heart. The the F has a bunch of, that says my one, and people wrote down their one on the board. And they took two cards, one with them and one on the board. And they put it up there. The O is, uh, we invited our children to draw their family. And that was fun. 
and because we're four families. And the R has dirt from people's homes and neighborhoods and even college campuses because we said we're for Birmingham. We're for, you are part of the movement to be for Birmingham wherever you are. And today we wanted to add to that board your one, if you didn't get a chance to be a part of it, or maybe your one has already come, or maybe you want to double down on that prayer. And in just a moment, our band is going to sing a song, and there's these packets. And there's a reason, there's a reason we didn't hand these to you when you came in, because I want you to work for it. I want you to want it a little. I want you to get up out of your chair and walk and pick it up, because your one is worth it. It's a little different. It's got a card for you to take home, to set on your dash or in your wallet. But it's got a little, a little, little person. There's a pen and I just want you to write their initials on the bottom, on the back. Or you could write their first name, no first and last. And I want you to commit to praying for them for the next two months. I want you to set a timer, uh, an alarm on your phone at 401, 41, every afternoon. And I want you to take this and I want you to go put it in the open slots on that R. And every Sunday morning for the next two months, I want to just be a reminder to you that we've got room for your one. And in January, we're gonna have this grand opening. And I want to invite you to invite them to come sit with you. And it's gonna be exciting. There's gonna be so much newness. But I hope there's a lot of ones. And not because we did some slick marketing, but because we prayed for them, because we love them, because we invited them, and because we did this for them. I, I walk through that building every day to just to check and make sure they're not painting walls wrong colors. It's going to be so exciting when they turn over the keys. But that's not the end. That's when God's just getting started. Because when it's about reaching the one, the work is never done. So let's get started, beginning with yours. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you that you saw us when we were the one. We've got some names on our hearts. Some of them we're gonna see over the holidays. Some of them we're gonna see tomorrow morning. Some of them we sit in a classroom with, sit across a cubicle from. Some of them we live with. And we are not willing to go about business as usual when there's one lost sheep who needs to find their way home. God, we have a burden for them Lord, our heart, but not to make this church bigger, but our heart is to overpopulate heaven one at a time. In Jesus' name, amen.